started, would love it if you would fill out these Connect cards. It's a great tool for us to stay connected uh, throughout the weeks and months to come. So please uh, fill one of those out if you're here in person and put those in the uh, in the purple baskets as you leave. If you'd like to do it even quicker and with better technology, you can go ahead and use um, these scan cards, these QR codes that are at the pews, at the end of those pews and also online. It will take you directly to a link on our Kent Cub website where you can just put in your information right away. If you have a prayer request, please let us know because we do share those with the prayer chain. We want to pray with you on those. If you've had uh, an answer to prayer, we want to celebrate that with you as well. Just let us know those on those cards or those QR phones. All right. Got a bunch of stuff to go through here because it's a busy season of the year. And a lot of things we've skipped. We haven't done them for a couple years. So we're, gonna, we're slowly getting back together. So there's a few things I want to tell you about that are coming up. And the first one is, is that tonight... It's the second Sunday of the month, so we're having open mic night. That happens at 7.30 tonight. That'll be in the, in the Fireside Cafe. Uh, come. You don't have to perform. You can just come and enjoy the evening. It's going to be a lot of fun. I hope that you can make it tonight. Also, today is the last day that you can uh, reserve a spot at the New Horizons Thanksgiving box lunch. If you're not sure what New Horizons is, take a look at me. All right? If you're as young as me or older... You are a New Horizons person, okay? And we'd love to have you come and be a part of that. Also coming up a week from Tuesday, we have our Service of Gratitude, which is Tuesday night, November 23rd at 7 p.m. right here in the Worship Center. Uh, you know, this has been a couple weird years, and we haven't had one of these for a while, and we want to have an open mic night, because we want to hear your stories of how God has been faithful to you through the pandemic as we come and worship and give gratitude to Him for that. Also that same weekend on, on Saturday, we're having a new thing called Deck the Halls. Saturday the 27th from 3 to 5 p.m. We're going to gather as a church, all ages, to come together to kind of get the church ready and kick off our Advent season. We're going to have cookies, cocos, and carol. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. Hope that you will put that on your calendar. Please come to that. And also, don't forget that same weekend on Sunday, November 28th, the Angel Tree Angels will be up. Angel Tree is a ministry that we have where people buy presents who's, for children whose parents are incarcerated. We've been doing it for a number of years. It's always been a tremendous blessing. And uh, hope that you will come and pick up an angel that, at that time. If you need more information, all this stuff is available at our website, kentcove.org. And now I'm going to send it over to Peter and let's worship. Thanks, Pastor Dan. Yeah, my name is Peter. I'm the Director of Worship and Arts here at King Cub. It is a joy and an honor to be with you this morning. Thank you uh, for setting apart time in your week uh, to gather as the body, to worship, to pray, to learn, to grow, to sing, um, it's to encourage one another. It's a really good thing that we do. And whether you're here or on, at home, online, uh, I'm just so honored and glad to be with you. And I invite you to stand as we continue our worship together uh, through singing. Shaper, mountain maker. 
the stars sing out they can't contain the praises of their God earth creator heaven shaker and it all begins and ends with you it all begins and ends with you the first the last the center of it Song 
every breath turn my heart to sing thy grace streams of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above praise the mountain fixed upon mount of thy redeeming love and here I raise my Ebenezer hither by thy help I'm come and I Church, let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord. Father, we pray. We thank you. And we come into your presence. And we gather together as a church. To worship your holy name. To worship your precious presence here among us, Lord. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your love. I thank you for revealing yourself to us this morning. Lord, like the psalmist says in Psalm 23, even though we walk through the valley, the darkest valleys, we fear no evil. For your rod and staff will comfort me. Lord, may this be true for those of us who are walking in the darkest valleys through the darkest moments, through the loss in their life, through the depression and the loneliness and the frustrations. Father, Lord, reveal yourself to them. Make yourself be tangible. Remind them that you are with them, that your Holy Spirit is comforting them, Father God. Lord, I pray that you will anoint us with your oil that our cup will overflow. Like you said to Paul, that your grace is sufficient for him. May that be true for all of us. May our cups be filled and overflow with your grace. May your goodness and love and mercy follow us for the rest of our lives. And we surrender ourselves 
into your precious hand. And give us the strength for those who lack strength and give us the hope for those who feel hopeless. Hold our hands and walk us through the paths of righteousness, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. You can go ahead and have a seat. Hey, Can't Have Kids. It's me again, Mr. Kevin. And I'm here this Sunday to talk to you about a word. That word is miracle. Do you know what that word means? Is a miracle like magic, like what a magician does? Well, no, it's not. Magic tricks are something that practically anyone can do if they spend their time and give some effort to learn how and have patience to develop some skills. Have you ever seen magic tricks performed? Were you able to figure out how they were done? Was it a card trick or maybe someone making something disappear and reappear? If you ask your grown-ups, I bet they can help you find books and videos on how to learn how to perform magic tricks. Maybe they might even be able to do some themselves. But a miracle isn't anything like magic. The dictionary says a miracle is a surprising and good event that can't be explained by nature or science, and so is considered to be the work of a divine power. That means that a miracle is something really amazing, sometimes completely unexpected, that nobody can explain except to say that it had to be from God. When Jesus fed the 5,000, that was a miracle. He did that. And nobody who uh, was there was able to explain how it happened, how he took five loaves of bread and two fish and fed thousands of people. As those baskets were passed around, they were never empty until everyone had enough to fill their bellies. In doing that, in that miracle, Jesus was showing everyone there that he was God and that God was present with them. And those people took their experience being present in that miracle in the presence of God and told everyone about it so that even today we read about that miracle in the Bible. So the next time you see something amazing, think about that word miracle and whether what happened can be explained. If it can, that doesn't mean it isn't really cool, but if it can't be explained, if it really can't, that might just be a miracle and a sign, proof, that God is there with you. Yeah. Something to think about. Well, a lot to think about. So think about it. And I'll see you again soon. Okay? Bye-bye. All right, at this time, I'd like to invite our kids to head to the doors in the back here um, to head on up to their workshops. Parents, you're welcome to walk with them, and if you haven't already signed them in, it only takes a minute in the foyer, and there's someone there happy to help you do that. And as they go, church, let's sing this blessing over them. Go with God to play your part in his story. Go with my bearers of God's glory. Go with peace to love and serve and fear. Go with love and live as though it's real. Go with love, go with God.
hearts of my enemies. Though the arrow flies and the terror of night is at my door, I trust you. morning, King Cuff. This morning we're going to be looking at a passage from the book of James, beginning in chapter 4, verse 13 through chapter, or through verse 17. Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this city or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. Why, do you, why you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. If anyone, then, knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. Please join me in prayer. Bless us this day, O Lord, with vision. May this place be a sacred place, a telling space where heaven and earth meet. Amen. This morning, we're going to talk a little bit about, we're going to continue to talk about stewardship, and this morning we're going to talk about the stewardship of time, and it occurred to me as I was thinking about this that sometimes time that may appear to be wasted is time well spent, Right? Sometimes time that appears to be wasted is time well spent. I came across a story recently of a man named Al Nixon. This is Al sitting on a bench 
in, uh, I believe he's in Tampa Bay, Florida. And um, so the story is this. Uh, and what struck me about this story is if you just look at this picture, you think, well, that's just some guy sitting, enjoying the view, wasting time, right? Because in our culture, pretty much any time you sit quietly and do nothing, you are by definition, or at least the definition that's ground into us, wasting time, right? But Al, so Al is sitting there, and apparently the story goes something like this. Al was having a tough time at work, and so he began uh, going to this bench in a park every morning and just sitting quietly and uh, watching, the, you know, watching the sunrise over the ocean and just having some quiet time for himself. And um, over time, he began, of course, to to recognize people, right? The same folks would come by on their bikes or on their walk or on their run or whatever. And the story goes that on one uh, morning, one of these strangers did something really strange, right? They spoke to him. (laughs) And this woman simply said uh, to him, without really any preamble, she said, I know when I see you sitting there, that everything is going to be all right. So over time, as Al had sat on this very same bench and just not really engaged with anybody, just to have some quiet time for himself, this became a moment of meaning for one of these people who was walking by. And so after this experience, Al began to greet people. And he says this about listening. He says, listening is the number one skill all mankind needs to know really well. Right? Very wise. Listening is the number one skill all mankind needs to know really well. And it turns out that as he did this, this simple act of sitting on a bench and being willing to acknowledge strangers as they went by and to listen has turned into something amazing. Al still goes there in the mornings, but now there's a line of people waiting to talk to him. Um, And Al just sits there and listens. And as this has gone on, some of these folks, uh, actually you can go to this very bench and you can identify which one it is because they have put a plaque on this bench saying, um, this. It says, Al, a loving and loyal friend and confidant to many forever and always. Al found his bench. And initially, something that was simply a place of solitude for him became something much more. Now, as we move into our text this morning, I want to be very clear about one thing. This is not a time management sermon, okay? Because I am convinced that so much of what we do and how we approach the spiritual life is misguided. Because we look at a picture like this, and if we didn't have any background, we might be tempted to think, well, that's just a dude wasting time. Because we're so driven, we're so... uh, production oriented we always have to be doing something and so the question occurred to me what if our stewardship of time is more about who we are and who we are becoming rather than what we are doing what if our stewardship of time is more about who we are and who we are becoming And I would even expand that to say, what if our discipleship, what if our following of Jesus was more about who we are and who we are becoming than it is about what we are producing? Because the focus uh, shift becomes important as we follow Jesus. So much of what we do is focused on production and doing that we have forgotten that Jesus' primary concern 
is turning us into kingdom people, not kingdom producers. So as we look at this passage from the book of James, we have this sense of time, right? There's this sense, and I I picked this passage because in some ways, even though obviously it's a text from the Bible, so this is thousands of years old, there's something, I think, at least for me, quintessentially American about the attitude in this passage, right? I'm going to just read it real quick, the beginning of it again for you, and see if you can pick up what I mean. Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this city or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. Why? You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. We have, even in the church, an addiction to thinking that we control time and that we control production and that we control output. Now, I had hopes, maybe hopes is too strong of a word, but I wondered at the beginning of the pandemic if this would change. Because the illusion of control that that lies over so much of our lives was ripped away in that moment, right? Right? All of a sudden, everything shuts down. So it doesn't matter. The virus doesn't care that you made plans today or tomorrow to go to this city or that city to carry on business and make money because guess what? Life is now closed. And we don't have any control over it whatsoever. Now, we can ignore it to our peril, of course, but the attitude is still there. And I wondered if that would change. I'm not sure that it has. But this text just captures that attitude. And so maybe it's not so much an American attitude as it is in a a human attitude, but this idea that we control our destinies. It's one of our favorite myths in America, right? The, you know, anyone can do it, all of those things. We control our destinies. Well, the author has some very sharp words for that. This beginning of this verse, now listen, you who say. Now listen is a very, the, the Greek there is very sharp. It's, it's bringing people up short. And it's pointing out that this is an ongoing attitude. You who say is in the present tense. It's an ongoing situation. And what do we notice about this first verse? What's happening here? What we notice is the following. We notice that a plan is made. Today or tomorrow, we will go to this or that city, right? Plan is made. The time is set. The place is clear. And the duration is clear. And the goal is clear. We love our goals, don't we? The goal is money. We're going to make some money. We're going to go to this city today or tomorrow. We're going to stay there for this amount of time. We're going to make money. What is missing in this plan? What is missing is any mention whatsoever of God. Any recognition that we are not sovereign, but God is sovereign. And so the letter goes on to remind us of that fact. In very stark language, you are a mist. Last week we looked at the letter of, or we looked at the book of Ecclesiastes. And uh, one of the refrains in that um, book is similar to this. That you are a mist, a vapor, 
Life is a vapor. It's here and it's gone, right? And so this idea the, that you are a mist is meant to draw us up short and to recognize that we do not have as much control as we like to think. We can lay all the plans we want to lay, but the reality is, is that we're in control of very little. So the author then goes on and talks about how um, we can make plans and how we ought to make plans. And he says, instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. So this idea of um, saying that we should... If it is the Lord's will, we will do this or that. If it is the Lord's will, we will do this or that. The basic conviction is that God is sovereign and we are not. So that is at, at, very, at a minimum a recognition that if it's God's will, we'll do this. If it's not, we won't. But the problem is, is that for so many of us, especially those of us who grew up in the church, we can get lost in this idea of God's will, right? I think probably one of the most common questions I'm asked as a pastor is, what is God's will for my life? Should I take this job or that job? Should I marry this person or that person? Should I go to this school or that school? Should I do this or that? And we always want to, we always have this idea that God has this particular decision for us. I'm about to step on some toes, blow some minds, but I'm pretty convinced that very often God doesn't care whether you take this job or that job. What God does care about is that you are his and that you live in a kingdom way, that you are a kingdom person, that you are being formed more and more into the image of Jesus. You see, because oftentimes I think when we ask that question, what we really want is we want someone to confirm our desires, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Here's another reality. The, the reality is, is that God gives us desires for a reason. And we've been taught in the church very often that we're, we should like we should sublimate or push those desires away or down. And obviously there are those desires that are inappropriate, right? But other desires are not so much. So perhaps the answer to what is God's will for you of whether you take this job or that job or you go to this school or that school or you do this or that is, well, which one do you want? It's radical, I know. But ultimately, if we really believe that God is more concerned about the kind of person we are than whether we're in this particular job or that particular job, there's a great deal of freedom and beauty in that, right? What this is not, this idea of if it is God's will, we will do this or that, is oftentimes I think we like to use that to determine God's will, especially for other people. It's one of our favorite activities. <laughs> uh, I can't tell you how many times I've had somebody come to me, Pastor, God told me that you're supposed to do this. You're supposed to say this. You're supposed to not say that. You're supposed to... My response is always, well, that's interesting. God didn't tell me that. We use that like a weapon, right? Right? God's will is for us to become more and more like Jesus and to act more and more like Jesus and to trust more and more that God's kingdom is expanding. Verse 16 says, As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. So here's a question, life lesson question for us to think about. As I mentioned, I wondered at the beginning of all of this pandemic uh, realities whether or not this would 
finally draw us up to some kind of conclusion about how we live life, how we order our lives, how we recognize how much or how little control we have. Because we love to boast in our arrogant schemes. Now, boast may be strong, but we like to make plans. We like to have a five-year plan, a ten-year plan, a, you know, goals, all of these different things. And there's a place for all of that stuff. But there's something going on here that this, this attitude of boasting is this confidence. And this is maybe uh, where we get a little more quintessentially American, right? We love a self-made person, right? And we love when a strong leader boasts about their plans and their schemes. And they address exactly how they're going to do this, that, or the other thing. The text here... Um, Literally translated would be, you are boasting in your arrogant pretensions. Puts a little bit of a different spin on it, right? The pretension being that you're in control of any of this. And then the next sentence is hard to understand. All such boasting is evil. This is one of those places where you have to do a real deep dive into the Greek to understand what's happening here, okay? So are you ready? Here we go. All such boasting is evil. It's literally what it means. Not bad, not just not so good, maybe not a good idea, um, mildly offensive, uh, you know, hurtful. I mean, pick your, pick your word that we like to use. No, that's not what the text says. The text says that this boasting is evil. So in other words, maybe don't do it. Stop it. Knock it off. Why? I believe it has to do with this. I think the kind of arrogant certainty that that is demonstrated by the kind of boasting that's being talked about here and that we see that we so, um, we get kind of wooed by it. The reason that this warning is there and this, this hard language of calling this boasting evil is that I think it's because such Arrogant certainty leads to all kinds of evil acts. This kind of certainty leads to all kinds of evil acts. It is when we are certain that we are right that we oftentimes do the most horrible things and say the most horrible things. Because we're absolutely certain that we know the truth and nobody else does. Or at very least the people we're trying to deal with don't and we're going to instruct them. Humanity's greatest atrocities begin in this kind of arrogant certainty. I'm convinced of it. Look at every um, of the greatest atrocities in human history. And at the root of them, you will find this kind of arrogant certainty. The rise of the Third Reich in Germany in, uh, you know, in the beginning or the middle of the 20th century began with this kind of arrogant certainty. Right? I mean, all of the atrocities that that we can look at in history, if you go back and you look closely enough, you will find some arrogant certainty at the core of it. The belief that this people or that people are not uh, made in God's image. And therefore, we should be able to do X, Y, or Z. We should be able to behave in this way or that way. The scourge of racism in our country comes at its very core from the very beginning. The certainty that that the African people were not fully human. It's even in our founding documents. And so we see the arc that that takes. It's that kind of arrogant certainty that begins uh, the evil. That's why it's evil. So the antidote to that certainty is to center the knowledge of God's sovereignty. The recognition that we, not only do we not control the future, we are not the center of the future. God is. Humility is what is required. 
Humility to recognize that we only understand in part. We only see in part. As Paul says, we see through a mirror darkly. The text goes on to say then in verse 17, If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. Knowing what should be done obligates us to do it. This is a hard text. This is a hard verse. This is challenging. Because if you want proof that we are all sinful... This verse gives it to you. Because there is not one person in this room, there is not one person joining us online who always does what they know is the right thing to do. Right? And so we recognize then that we are sinful. But it doesn't help us to escape from this text. Knowing what should be done obligates us to do it. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. So how do we do that? How, do we, how could we possibly do that? Because I think our an immediate reaction is to begin to make plans like we did at the beginning of the verse, right? I mean, this is what we're kind of addicted to. Oh, well, if we know the good and we ought to do it, then we make a plan and we have a, a three-step process of how we always do the right thing. And, oh, well, let me help you with that. Um, I'll give you a, a, a three-step plan and I'll, I'll hold you accountable to that plan. Right? Anybody want to live in, in that community? Right? I mean, we have this automatic desire to, like, regulate it, to make a plan for it, to, to, to control it. But here's the thing. If we are going to become the kind of people who do the good they know they ought to do, there's only one way we can do it. Have you met Jesus? Jesus. Have you met Jesus? Not respectable Jesus. Not political Jesus, but radical Jesus. The Jesus that we read about and meet in the Gospels. The Jesus of the Gospels. The Jesus who tells a woman at the well everything she's ever done and her response is joy. The Jesus... Who heals the broken. The Jesus who calls to the man sitting at the well, do, do you want to be made whole? The Jesus who reaches out and touches the leper. The, the Jesus who spits and makes mud and puts it on the eyes of the blind man. The Jesus who speaks truth to the powerful and the supposed righteous because they exclude those very broken people. The Jesus who shows mercy and grace even in the very midst of being crucified. That Jesus. Have you met Jesus? The only hope you and I have of bringing the hope of Jesus to the world is to have met him ourselves. And not the sanitized, politicized, uh, explained away version that we so often get, but the raw, unadulterated, radical wandering rabbi who 
who wasn't afraid. to touch the unclean, to heal the broken, or to speak truth to power. Because it is, it is in knowing that Jesus that we begin to learn and know what the right thing to do is and then are able through the power of the Spirit to do it. Any schemes or programs or things that we cook up on our own to try to do it don't work. Because the kingdom of God begins in that healing. I think I've told you before but one of my favorite stories about that comes from Brennan Manning, who is one of my spiritual mentors, who says that the Cajun people in, in the southern United States used to talk about those who had met Jesus and refer to them as those who had been seized by a powerful affection. The only hope for us is to allow ourselves to be seized by that relentless tenderness of Jesus and to allow him to transform us so that we might become holy wasters of time who sit on a bench and learn to listen. Now, I don't know Al's story. I don't know if Al claims to follow Jesus or not, but I know that that example of being willing to simply sit and listen is an example of kingdom generosity. And I think the response that we see is a demonstration that the world is in desperate need of that kind of love and grace and acceptance. So the question for us is, what is our bench? What is our bench? What is the, the, the holy waste of time that you might discover where you get drawn into people's lives? And, and given the opportunity to share the grace and love of Jesus with them. I don't have that answer for you. I don't even have that answer for me, to be honest with you. But I know that that is what we're called to. Sitting with our brothers and sisters and simply listening might be the most holy act that we can do. And it might also, for some of us, be the hardest thing we can do. Because we want to provide answers, we want to provide steps, we want to provide all of those things, and, and the time for those things maybe comes, but initially, what might it look like if we sought to be Jesus to a broken and hurting world, even though it looks to some like a holy waste of time. Amen.
Brothers and sisters, friends, go now knowing that you are loved by God the Father, that you are redeemed by the grace of Jesus Christ, that you are empowered by the Holy Spirit now and always to share that love and grace with a broken and hurting world. Go in peace. Amen.